Hmm. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Brooklyn Historical Society. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight for this program titled The Prisoner, the Poet, the Returning Citizen, Witnessing the Carceral State. I want to say just a few words before we begin. This program is a long time in the making. It was actually last October when I met Randall Horton, the poet, uh, and the seeds for tonight were planted. Today is the publication of Randall's latest book of poems titled number 289-128, where he conveys in ways that maybe only poetry can, um, the experience of being incarcerated, getting out, reclaiming your life, just the lived experience of all of, all of that. Um, so we at, here at the Brooklyn Historical Society, virtually, um, we are incredibly honored and ex excited to um, be hosting this celebratory program slash launch, launch book launch event. I'm honored um, to also welcome the two other powerful poets who join Randall tonight, Dwayne Betts and Louise K. Wicca Egan, uh, and to welcome tonight's moderator, or MC, if you will, Kate Meisner, who's the program director of the Prison and Justice Writing Program at Penn America. Before I turn it over to Kate's, just a few quick notes. I wanna thank our funder, Humanities New York, uh, who with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities helped to make this program possible. I also wanna let all of you know that we will take your questions. You can ask questions of Randall, Dwayne, Louise, Kate's throughout the program by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and they'll be looked at and taken towards the end of this, of this program. And finally, I wanna share that we wanna make it easy for everyone to buy copies of not only Randall's book, uh, but also of the amazing volumes by Duane and Louise locally. So uh, we will put in the chat a way for you to purchase all of them through the community bookstore, which is in Brooklyn. So now it is my pleasure to turn this shindigs over to Kate's. Again, thank you all for being here. Oh, Marcia, thanks so much. What a wonderful introduction. I am so excited and honored to be here with you all. I am excited to, though we will go deep, celebrate Randall Horton's extraordinary new collection. I have to start by saying, of course, that Randall is a friend, which makes this additionally special for me. Uh, as you know, he's a writer of poetry and prose and a tenured full professor of English at the University of New Haven. And personally, he's been a great friend to our prison and justice writing program at Penn America. So I have a special connection to him through uh, his contributions in that realm. He has a much more extensive and exciting bio that includes a bevy of impressive awards, membership in a literary band, he's very cool and much, much more, but I'll let you read about him later. I wanna move us into poetry and conversation. Uh, I think it's gonna be a really special night. I wanted to also open with the blurb that I had the honor of writing for Randall's book to give a little frame um, and understanding of what you're about to hear a little bit. Uh, the blurb says, Horton sketches a face of incarceration that as the system wills it, appears interchangeable and dismissible to the public eye. But in these pages, his collectivized voice becomes a form of power, a force impossible to ignore. Horton's true gift lies in the refusal of neat packaging, in questioning both the possibilities and failures of language, routinely, routinely turning poetry on its access to examine, can craft appropriately hold the sheer violence of incarceration. Horton's book is at once a landmine of nuance and a strong medicine against our country's most oppressive and horrific system. Tonight's reading is structured through the three sections of Randall's book, and what you'll hear is Randall share a selection of poems, and then we'll jump from those into conversation about writing in the criminal justice system. There's so much to talk about, but we're going to try to get a little more specific uh, um, and wade into it together. Uh, 
I'm excited too that we'll be joined by the folks that are mentioned. Uh, Reginald Duane Betts, who is the author of four books, poetry and memoir, most recently the astonishing poetry collection Felon, that I had the honor of reading in PDF form uh, because Duane was also a fellow in our Writing for Justice program. So it's an evening of, of friends and collaborators. He also has a unbelievable bio, including a PhD from Yale Law School, and very recently launched the Million Books Project that will bring curated 500 book literary time capsules to 1,000 prisons and juvenile detention centers to each state in the United States, Washington, DC, and Puerto Rico. It is a phenomenal effort. But before all this, whew, we're going to open and set the stage with the poetry from Luis K. Wakaigan. I met Luis uh, when she was at Minnesota's Shakopee Correctional Institution. Uh, I got to participate and read in her book launch for the chapbook, This Is Where, that came out on Willow Books this year. It is phenomenal. She really brings a lot of heart uh, and culture and a women's perspective to the conversation. And it's, uh, she's a friend also, and it's my true honor to turn the stage over to her to set the tone tonight. Hello, everyone. What an honor to be here. And uh, Kate just called me friend. So I am going to run with that all night long. My heart just jumped out of my chest. This is amazing. Uh, congratulations to Randall. Um, what an epic human being. Just your contribution, your solidarity, your willingness to be in truth. Um, it is an honor honored to be with you and uh, I'm so excited um, to even just share my poetry and kind of just open this up and uh, you know when we think about mass incarceration <clears throat> no institution really allows for the individual story and as many of us know there are so many individual stories that just get lost in the blur and, and for some reason they get silenced and as someone with a voice, <clears throat> I'm not gonna be silenced anymore. I'm not gonna allow those stories to not be heard. And so if my small story can reach somebody, then, then I am more than willing to be, <clears throat> be involved. And so the first poem that I would like to share tonight um, came from a conversation that I had with someone while still incarcerated and I left that conversation knowing that I just didn't offer all that I could to my friend. Um, and so for a way for me to handle that within myself, I wrote a poem. <clears throat> Commonality between tribes. I watched tears drop down her cheeks as she shielded her tattooed skinny arms over her slouched frame. I kept my head down aware of others around us. She fought those tears, blatant, submissive combat. We were not in a prison day room anymore. She took me beyond to the gravesite of her deceased. I didn't ask to go. I wanted distance between us. She spoke of death and its after aftermath on her life and posture. Sitting by her side, I wasn't thinking of her pain. I went to the yellow house in Six Mile, the last house I seen Bobby alive in. I didn't get distance from her. She didn't make peace with those tears. Silence betrayed us both. If I can share one more, I will. This next one <clears throat> was written quite some time ago. And so it really um, captures the, the mindset that I was in when I received my sentence and how a young woman in her 20s deals with that. Um, so this is what I wrote nine years ago. Nine years ago, I was 23. Nine years ago, I watched a man get shot. 
nine years ago, I pled guilty to a crime nine years ago, I didn't believe I was guilty of. Nine years ago, I was all I was concerned about. Nine years ago, I couldn't even see seven years into the future. Because nine years ago, one of my criminal charges demanded 40 years. I couldn't even see seven. No connection between my mind and my heart. No awareness of thoughts to words, words to actions and actions to character. Nine years ago, I was a victim of myself and everyone was to blame. But I'm moving on beyond that crime, beyond that one night, complex and unforgiving. In part, it is my choosing. In part, it's my mother's instruction. Nine years ago, she told me life goes on. I was shattered by that cold, unforgettable, unforgivable statement nine years ago. Today, praise God for that statement. Today, praise God for my mother. It means life goes on. It means it's no longer nine years ago. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Randall. I am so, so proud of you. Love to all. Stay safe, guys. Thank you, Louise. And you're not going anywhere because you'll be joining us for the conversation as well. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you very much. She brought us right into the heart of the conversation. I mean, talk about an opener, Louise. That was powerful. Chills. I had to remind myself I had to talk after you read. And actually, that second poem was a particularly good entryway into part one of our experience tonight, which is named after Randall's first chapter in the book, Property of the State. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Randall, to share a few poems with us. All right. We're just going to get started, and then um, we will sort of come back around and say my thank yous and my, you know, uh, my appreciative, I'm very appreciative for everything. And so we'll get to that. 289128, Animals. The only thing less than a nigger is a prisoner. Roger Fentress, August Correctional Center. A heat wave envelops the mid-Atlantic abnormal like the notion of prison. Outside an unrelenting centigrade oven bakes the male housing unit. Cells are jam packed with the guilty who played out though very innocent. Seven sounded better than 25 straight for more than a few consecutive days. There is a spell cast over the complex. A five-inch fan oscillates the aroma of piss from the toilet bowl in this jungle life, where grown men and young boys blend each inmate's sadness compounded. No shade, nowhere to hide and running would get that ass shot at the razor fence dangling in blood so you sit, suffer while asking. Is this how the story ends? 289128, rhetorical, perhaps. We do not experience movement, the cell is setting a chronic theme we do not experience, only exists. In the frame behind the cell, we stand each step in place with the next still standing, we do not move until told. This instant, we only have moments. Mementos we lived in slow motion, a cinematic dream. I see you the good, while we evildoers rock like pomegranate, once sweet, fresh, and vibrant. Rehabilitation is love letters to a ghost. Discourse in the day room, we look at the world on TV to see our false selves inside a constructed frame until told we entered as if we never left. 289128, or this malice thing never to be confused with justice. Nothing symbolic, okay, dark is dark, cage is cage, hunted and hunter are both in the literal. Make belief in what ifs do not exist a lie. Nothing cryptic here, okay, rape is rape, pray, must pray no minute in the future, safe from quiet insertions of a shank and masking tape, okay. Nothing here infinite. Only time is constant to the merciful and merciless. There are no allegories to hide behind. 
He slid his wrist, I mean, he slid his fucking wrist, okay? There is a cell with one window just before day. Dawn's early demise magnifies a dull metal toilet. The cool water cooling two can sodas. Each wall a slab of soft gray cylinder block. No posters featuring eroticized women with an exclusive in black tail, okay? The wall that slits the light does not reveal nothing new ever. The expose, the changing same. Always a holding. One window offers a gateway. My face pressed against the window in time. Rules this empire, okay? The mind held hostage by time. Mind and body conjoined twins. The other wall holds a frame. The frame holds a metal door to contain utter disbelief of the visible walls are gray, not like summer, but darker. Yes, there is darkness. Okay. All right, we'll stop here. Yeah. Turn it like back. you need to give a give a minute in the air for that. It's powerful and you have such a singular voice, Randall, on the page and, and out loud. Hearing your voice deliver this is another experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The section of the book and, and the poems in it very painfully lay out the feeling of doing time, the lack of autonomous movement, the one window you describe pressing your face to, the lack of color and texture, the unmetaphor, so to speak, of the very real violence and human, right, human rights violations that run rampant in prisons. Right. For, for me doing this work, one of my the most striking lines was rehabilitation is writing love letters to a ghost. I was bowled over by that. Right. And what it brought up for me was that word, rehabilitation. It's a concept that's been sort of falsely paraded as part of the system's goals and efforts. But as your poems clearly illustrate, and we know, uh, rehabilitation in prison is, is really control and punishment. Right. So I'd love to hear from you and from Duane and Luis in brief about this mythology of re rehabilitation. Uh, is that word that's often used by reformists even strong enough for the change needed in the justice system? Yeah, that's an interesting question, you know, first of all. I mean, I've been thinking about this question more and more each, you know, and, you know, because always there's no uniformity within the idea of rehabilitation, first of all. I mean, especially when you're talking about on the state level, um, you know, states operate a lot of times independent in terms of how they even allow the system to try to really rehabilitate you. And so, you know, the, the roadblocks to, you know, to actual concrete, true rehabilitation is often deterred by, you know, bureaucracy, red tape, lack of, no funding, this, that, and the other. So, yeah, I mean, you can find some pockets of that because obviously there, there are things that happen. You can get a workshop, you can go do this, you might can take a class. In some places you might even get a, but you know, uniformly in terms for me, um, you know, we don't necessarily look at it in terms of one lens of how we can sort of like address the problem. You know, we can all talk, because there are many advocates that have these different points of views, but you know, how do we sort of attack, you know, get, you know, look at this problem in terms of rehabilitation and taking that to like on the collect in a in a collective, I guess a collective voice, right? Or a collective narrative. If that's even possible, I don't know. I'm gonna let Dwayne sh um chime in with that and um obviously and, and Louisa see what they say about it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's rough, man. Uh, I, but you know what's wild, though, is like, I mean, you know, rehabilitation is a love letter written to a ghost. That shit implicates not just the system, but it implicates society. Right. And like, for me, you know, I think the power of these poems, even the first one, it's lines in there that I just find funny because they are humorous to me. You know what I mean? And it might be because I know it, but I also think because the writing is more than just the writing is indictment, but the writing is reflection and the writing is lifting the conversation above all of that stuff. Because even when you say animals, who was the animal? You know, it's a question in that. It is not an assertion. And it's right. like very easy to read it superficially and imagine that it's just an assertion. And, and you know, I would argue, I don't know what the system is for, but, but we can make these, these cases about every system that we're a part of. What is the public school system for? What is the healthcare system for? Like, I think that those questions are actually demeaning to what poetry does. 
Because the thing is, like, it is a partisan answer to all of those questions. But the poems in here, at their worst, make people on both sides or all 57 sides of every ledger say, oh, shit, I hadn't considered that. Right. You know, and, 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 and I think that for me, I, you know, I would be like a, a fool to argue that there's no such thing as rehabilitation in prison. Because I know what I was doing at 16. But the, the question about a word like rehabilitation is like, who is, who is the author of that? And, and, and I think that that makes it all more complicated. You know, and, and the truth is like, you read this book and you realize it ain't one author, you know? And, and, and the author typically is not who you expect it to be. So, you know, I guess my point is that when motherfuckers is in the world having conversations about rehabilitation, I'm trying to give them poetry. And, and I ain't trying to give them poetry because I believe poetry is rehabilitation. I'm trying to give them poetry because I believe poetry makes the conversation more soulful than, than one about uh, a fucking, like, I don't even like people who use seven, seven syllable words. Like rehabilitation, there's too many syllables in it. I don't even like, if you wrote a word with that many syllables and something that you were submitting to me, I'd be like, look, not only do I know, not know what it means, you don't know what it means. Like, what does rehabilitation even mean? You know, so the poetry is what is honest about how ineffable and difficult and almost like, if, if, like it's like the ether, you know? And, and I think the poems do that, you know, better than, um, better than the rhetoric, so. I love that, Dwayne. Thank you. And you always bring a nice combo of, uh, of keeping it real and levity to the conversation. I can always count on you for that. So it's great to have your voice here. Uh, Luis, uh, did you want to weigh in or, or chat about this at all? Uh, you know, when you talk about rehabilitation, I think the fact that we just kind of like sigh and just say, I don't know, first really relates the experience of the lack of the definition of rehabilitation. The first thing that came to my mind was, uh, I think you had used, you know, is there power? Is there enough power for rehabilitation? And when you define power, there's always oppression right next to that. And so when you think about mass incarceration, you think about institutions. There's, uh, for, for that institution to run the way it does, there has to be an imbalance of power. And they remind you of the power that you do not possess or, or the power that you think that you might have, they will abolish that thought right away. That, that is the power of, of mass incarceration. And so when, we, when I think about rehabilitation, there's a whole system. And I, and I, I think Duane was right about when we talk about various institutions in our society, I think we could pick apart many of them, but um, if we do not talk about the imbalance of power when it comes to rehabilitation, then we're, then we're just kind of making noises with each other. And I think the realist conversations, and I think why poetry makes such an impact is because it does affect your soul, but it also relates experience. And you can't change anything unless you can relate to experience. I, I don't know if that really answers the question. Um, I might have just, you know, kind of talked Absolutely. <laughs> um, but that's what I would add at this point. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I find rehabilitation to be a really troubling word because of all the points that all of you brought up. So thank you for, for taking that kind of amorphous question and, and bringing some nuance and, and different dialogue to it. You did exactly what I'd hoped. So I hope Randall's happy too. Right. No, and I will say the real the, the ghost part is is you can't. That's not that, that shouldn't be you know left out because I think that's like Dwayne says that sort of an indictment on society itself. You know, when you, when there's no one out there to sort of dialogue with those and they're writing these people and it's like they they disappear. And so you keep, so that's the that's another thing right there. You know, sending these cats sending these letters out uh, and hoping someone's you know writes you back. Conversation. But anyway. Absolutely. And I think that's a, what all of you talked about is, again, there's sort of these magical transitions that are coming up that lead us really beautifully into part two, which is called Poet in Residence, Cell 23. So now I'm not going to say more, Randall. I'll just let you bring us there.
289-128, open air market on Herkimer and Nostrum, Brooklyn, 1989. At the end of a tumultuous decade sequestered in the bad B movie, soldiers line antagonistic sidewalks dedicated to a lifelong commitment with a bag full of baggies. Too many block boys to mention marketing their brand of hook, line, and sinker. Death straight through a glass shooter. In the open single file, addicts arrive starry-eyed with dollar bills, coins, ghost memories of ornate smoke. Triple beam mathematics will balance each fate. Shadows are their faces who look upon the kid, no more than 12 and a gun, tucked waist level at the ready. He not alone as each protagonist packs armor their mother couldn't give them. Love of postscript, the tenement building held hostage by a pay pipeline from Bogota to the Big Apple, a primal scene. 289-128, when your silence will not save you. In the aftermath, you remember the fist upside her head. Did you see? Saying no almost instinctively, you say no again. You remember no audio with the beating to follow in the alley. You remember clearly not thinking the woman got beat from the other side of the street. Imagine you witness her walker of the night. Illusion to fantasy built up in your head, the after screen. In the alley, she could be dead. You thought no one will remember the freeze frame each night whispering in cell 23 at night. You could have saved me. 289128, before the beauty, or how could you forget? Locate the nearest overlooked neighborhood. Extract all humans restrained underneath life's boot heel. Replace with millennials coddling post-colonial guilt, but not. Ignore the woman's cardboard help, tattered, stained, and broken sign like her. Imagine being long ago unseen, erased in between the thong. Existing as non-entity, act two. If gone, be instrument, what chord whiz the mist crestfallen shadows, mute, lingering in limbo, a decade. Go from A to Z to list the dead. Too many to name, but try. Swan, bird, fella, Delante. No deader now than the moment of collision. Cold steel and shots fired. Death, what do we know of dying? Don't forget a love strangling addicts caught in a docetic whirlwind with no blue cell. Before the coda becomes distorted, remember. One more time inhale memory deep to include the bad and terrible beauty just beneath the living. Whew. Can you read that last line again? Uh -huh. so, so I read this in the last stanza. The stanza. Mm. Uh, before, before the corner becomes distorted, remember, one more time inhale memory deep to include the bad and terrible beauty just beneath the living. Mm. Thank you, Randall. So here, this chapter of the book, becomes a chronicling of a period of emotional opening is how I read it, a turn right. that allows for difficult memories to surface and in much more, still lyrical, but much more narrative form. Mm -hmm. You know, we see connected systems of oppression root causes of crime and equity, of course, not preachy, but embedded in those narratives. Right. And this is where the poet in the narrative is emerging. I mean, the title tells us that, but also we can feel it in the work. Where, uh, where there's a willingness to feel, to remember, to not numb out, to, to open despite the conditions uh, of prison. Yeah, so I'm interested, um, I'm interested to you know, hear your story about beginning to write in prison. And, and I'd like to hear Luis's and Duane's as well. As I, understand it, as I understand it, each of you came to writing while in prison. That can be sometimes romanticized, of course, or people are, you know, how did you find the strength in this moment to do that? We know all those things happen. Uh, so we could address that too when you respond. But I want to know a little bit about your journeys and about, you know, not just writing in your journal or for the emotional journey of it, although that's maybe where may or may not be where it started, 
but also, you know, when writing became your identity and the craft aspect of it uh, and perhaps community aspect propelled you. That's a lot of stuff. I hope you can parse through that. I try to streamline it. I mean, I, I started writing when I was in Montgomery County, um, getting ready to get my time. I hopped into a program called Jail Addiction Services. And the main reason I got into the program was because I thought I was going to get some time off my sentence. I hadn't necessarily made the change yet. Um, and I was trying to cut my time. Um, but in the program, there was a component of it um, that was sort of like um, a circle where you had to write these essays at night. And that was part of it. And that's when I began to start writing and equating writing with something about, you know, A, feeling B, good and being able to express myself. Um, and I took that sentiment um, all the way to when I went to Roxbury. Um, I started really trying to, because I had been writing and, and I, I liked the idea of, you know, nonfiction, but I didn't know what I was, what I was trying to do. I was writing the essays. But anyway, um, when I get to Roxbury, I started writing fiction and I had a character um, who's like, I think she, she was from Washington. Um, I think she was probably 12, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I, and I wanted her to be a poet. I just equated, I didn't know anything about, I don't know what a poet was and what that meant. But I equated, for me, it was like, you know, okay, well, she must be the smart, determined girl, and she needs to be a poet, because that's just it. And I don't know. <laughs> so I had to find out what a poet does. <laughs> and so that took me on a whole different journey. Um, and in, I actually, in, you know, me and Dwayne talked about this the other day, as a matter of fact, um, mentored by Ethelbert Miller a little bit from Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., and he began to sort of sort of guide me in the right direction. So when I, when I actually got out, um, I got into a, a, a creative work, writing workshop in Washington, D.C. It was Tony Medina um, at Howard was doing the workshop. And so we just dropped in um, because I started doing performance, slamming and all that. I wasn't at Howard, I was at UEC, but I went to that one workshop and I began to sort of like learning the craft part of it. And then I went to um, James Madison's Furious Flower, the second one. Um, in you know, in honor, in honor of Wendell Brooks. And it was there that I met like all of the people I had been reading from Amir Barak and Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Rita Dove. Um, you, the, the list went on and on and I'm just like, oh my God. And so I remember one night I went to Charlie's, we went to Charlie's, man, it was his B place. It was Amir Baraka, um, his wife, Amina, and a couple other people. And we just sat there and talked all night and they just were so inviting. I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, this is community to me. And so from that point on, you know, I knew that that's the path that I wanted to take. That's such a legacy and personal history. And wow, those names you just brought into the room. I mean, whew, I, I'm personally I always very I excited to hear. I couldn't even, I didn't even get them all in. That was just a sample. <laughs> but I'm just saying at that point in my life, as someone who was young, I mean, in terms of the poetry, I was older, obviously, but I was a baby in, you know, in this whole thing that we do. People still on. I came into this when I was almost 40 years old. Mm. So wow. every day is a learning experience to me, and I, so I try to treat it that way. So, you know. Thank yeah. you, and I'll yeah. invite Luis or Dwayne to jump in, and we can take this in any direction. I think personal origin stories of artists are very interesting, but... Um, you're welcome to chime in and expand the dialogue as well. Luis, you should go. Okay. Um, I, I have to say, Randall, I love that story that you were writing a story about a poet and you needed to <laughs> know what that meant. <laughs> um, that's a beautiful Yeah, yeah like name was Jasmine. I still, I still have the pages of it, you know. I remember the first poem, oh. too. Shout out to Jasmine, you know. <laughs> so I remember writing before incarceration, just what I call pretty poems. You know, the font was really nice. I had like pink pens or, you know, purple ink pens or whatever. And it was just, um, I, I don't know, adolescent grasp of truth, if I even could handle the truth at that point in time. And then when I was incarcerated, I liked the idea of what Randall had said about having conversation. Because when you're in a cell all by yourself, 
sometimes that room is full and there's nobody in there. And yet for what I learned was for me to make it in that cell by myself, I had to have conversations with myself. I had to sit there and deal with all of my own. <clears throat> you can fill in the rest of that statement. Right, and right. It took a lot of time. And, and when you have all of these words processing and mixing with emotions and, and climate and other people and all this other stuff, writing became the safe way for me to, to actualize it, to uh, remember it and then, and then have it and then put it aside or rework it or do whatever I want. And uh, so, so, so it became a necessity just for day to day in the environment that I was in. <clears throat> And it, it was a break from, from food service, from chow hall, because that was just a mission on itself, you know, from day to day. But then MPWW, Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop, came into the scene um, about probably 10 years into my sentence. But before that, there was a small collective called Writer's Workshop. And I know I talked about this with my own, with my own book, but these two women solidified the idea for me that I – do belong at the table. I, I, I had to really let that truth so, soak in. And MPWW, and shout out to Jennifer Bowen Hicks, um, the, the, the teachers and the volunteers with that organization, they didn't um, cut you any slack. They didn't say, oh, well, you're an incarcerated, so you know, we're gonna make this easy for you because you have a lot of other stuff going on. No, you, you had a seat at the table and you, you, you needed to be prepared. So that meant having your work done, having your writing done, but also being prepared to listen to the writers around you. You know what I mean? And sometimes just listening is a task in itself. And listening is a huge part of writing and writing poetry for me. Um, I don't know, um, or maybe I just don't really understand the romanticism um, with writing right while incarcerated or coming from that because um, it was survival for me for so many years. Just being able to, if you have anxiety and you can't catch your breath sometimes, nothing else matters at, at that point in time except for that one solid breath. And sometimes that's all that mattered. That's all that was needed was a pen and a paper. And even if maybe it was a napkin or it was a, a a, a pass or it was a scratch piece of paper for something those little uh articles collectively um just gave me the foundation to continue writing um it took me a long time to be able to say that i i am a poet um and it took a lot of people ar around me like randall said community once you have community i mean you can go anywhere so that's my thoughts Thank you, Louise. It's always so profound to hear you speak. And I think you illustrate too, you know, that the, the kind of romanticization I'm talking about is this survival within the belly of the beast. But what you just described could be transposed onto so many other people's journeys as well, although it has a specific life to it. And I think that's important to remember in the name. But thank you for all of that. We'll pass to Duane. Yeah, I don't... I don't know. I think, um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, you know, you say romanticized prison. I mean, I think in some sense, in some sense, you know, we romanticize success and, and I don't, origin story as a writer, you know, all of that shit is tied to prison, but at the same time, all of that shit is tied to effort into these intertwining relationships that are so hard to unravel because you know, we want to produce a, a, a thread to go through it. Um, all I know is, and I feel thankful for this, right? Is I started writing poetry for me. I kind of regret, like, I ain't never met a Mary Baraka. So I ain't had that moment. And I didn't go to college and get introduced to the writers I love by some, like, professor. Like, I didn't have that experience. And I think in some sense, prison gave me that thing that I share with uh, with Randall and with Luis and that like, you know, we got it from the dirt, so to speak. And a lot of the ways in which I've been fortunate to meet Lucille Clifton and to meet folks I never thought I would get a chance to meet 
I got it because I was honing, you know, this thing called writing when uh, when I didn't think nobody was listening. But kind of wild shit, though, it's like interesting thinking about, you know, the difference between some of my story and some of Randall's is that you know, I was writing in a box and, and it wasn't, you know, the sale was just a sale. You know what I mean? Writing was a vocation, but it was a vocation that I, I like to imagine that I would have adopted if I was, you know, in the Navy or, or whatever. You know, it was like, shit, I was like Shabin, you know what I mean? I was on the schooner and I was like doing my thing. And it ain't like, you know, prison made me a writer. It's like, there's a lot of motherfuckers in prison that ain't writers. So I don't want to act like it's the incos- it's the penitentiary that did that. It's right. just that ended up being the shit that I do. And in fact, I looked for something to do. And, and we make choices in this, you know what I mean? It just so happens that I cut my teeth in a penitentiary. Other people who are writers cut their teeth in the classroom. But what I'm thankful for is that in terms of this journey and this process, I know that it's a way to do it where you discover your own influences. And so I can, I, I, I know what it would have felt like, I think, to meet Baraka and be like, yo, shit, man, I know I was reading your joint, man, when we were standing up for count. Right. And that is that right. is the kind of experience, you know, that everybody can't, can't lay claim to, you know what I mean? Because some people like, yeah, I've been admiring your work since <laughs> Randall Horton introduced me to you. You know right. what I mean? And that's, that's cool too. Right. But, but the thing is, you know, when you're in the box, you ain't in the world you know, that had... It was a cell 23. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is like, I was reading you when the trajectory wasn't me wanting to be a writer, the trajectory was just like, I dig your work and that's why I'm reading it. So, I don't know, man. Origin stories overlap, you know? Survival stories overlap. But but the thing that, that is clear though is that like so much of this was about a concrete decision. And, and I think the, the way that we could talk about it and not romanticize it is always remember that there was a lot of decisions being made to keep doing this, you know? You leaned right in, Dwayne. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I think you always say, I don't know, man, but you, you always kind of bring us some great wisdom. So yeah. you we, know. Know you, we know you really know a little bit. A little bit. Uh, thank, you all. thank you all for reflecting on that. Um, I think that just through opening the space to these sort of tropes and, and uh, you know, stereotypes and these ways of speaking that people have and really digging under the surface, uh, a lot gets shattered. And I really appreciate that. Um, now we're going to come out of prison a little bit. Uh, the last section of the book is called Poet in New York. So Randall, bring us to Poet in New York. 289-128, Poet in New York. Remember, in a turn from the difficult thesis, think back to the slim praying man in cell 15 with needles stuck in vain. Religion or dope can stop time. Remember 72 in a unit built for 30, that never ending revolving door. All the overcrowded choir singing, I am the wretched of the earth. Typed on Smith Corona at night, how cell 23 demanded rabble art. What about the couple in cell 22? Lifers who found love doing a big. Father and son as cellies on the top tier, no generation will be left behind. Too many bodies lingering in limbo, the worn out illusion of truth see, memorialized faces you will forget. Victim turned perpetrator in cell six, sold at age eight for a bag of meth. Nothing is black and white. 289-128, a primer for a traffic stop. It's seated in car, remain calm, pull over. Position hands at 11 and 3 assume this will not go okay. Recall Brown, Bell, Martin, the trail of the bud. Ignore the raven hovering the rooftop. It's not a matter of respect, speech, or liberty. And yes, understand survival be right now if you survive. Swallow that pride. It can ignite swift death. Replay the past slow. Unarmed man shot with hands high. Or... Police chokehold too strong again, ignore the raven and recognize you the invisible thing being a boogeyman. A proletariat open season means you, baby boy. The target minimizing to a circling bullseye. You, 
This is not a game, nor a test, saying to you the game. Facts will be misremembered. He lunged, appeared to have a buzz, dressed wrong, reached a large metal object. The raven hovering your death. The raven hovering wants your death, but fuck that. Breathe deep and prepare for the figure approaching. 289128, Walking with Ghosts in Harlem. <clears throat> the paperback entered through the slit, man child in the promised land at count time. After the bag and baggage one night in a bar, all those images rushed back over laughter beneath a congregation of drunken voices. What did it mean, what did it mean walking with ghosts unseen to the neck in this dark demands? There's a scent lingering, will not leave, must stop, the clanking inside won't stop. Rock while is jaw jacking uninterrupted in the yard on Sunday. A circumference around the track again, and one airplane fighting cumulus clouds breaks free. Chained to the past, a corrective measure, looking for salvation in books I once wrote. Down these mean streets save me and Sonny within the esophagus of justice. About prison, the protagonist returns through a windowless sunset of tragedy. Having seen skylines etched in haze, there are walls packed behind this freedom, undiscovered and yet too real each day. An electric fence around the neck echoes, metal rattling long hours stretch. Either way, subject to a condition, a past, a dagger through the heart cannot kill. I don't want it to be over. I want more poems. <laughs> Whew. When I was thinking about what to talk about, obviously these poems deal a lot in the PTSD of the prison experience that follows whoever comes home home. But I also was thinking about how you and I have talked at length, Randall, about this uh, you know, concept of the prison writer label. And despite running a legacy program with that name, how limiting that language can become, how limiting that phrase is. Um, I also was thinking about a tweet, Duane, that you wrote that challenged the people first language of the reformist movement. You wrote, uh, I hope I'm not embarrassing you. I thought it was a great yeah, tweet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said, it, listen, you'd say this, we know you would. I really just don't like being called formally incarcerated as a part of my title. I'd much rather be called a carjacker or a convict or an inmate or a jailbird because to do all this shit and be reduced by your allies to a condition brought on by the pistol you held is wild. If you have six words to describe me, formerly incarcerated, shouldn't be a part of the list. So I'm thinking about the stigma of coming home from prison. There's an internal, right, PTSD. There's an external stigma in the world in concrete ways, housing, jobs. And then there's the stigma of language, right? So I want to think about the language of incarceration and as serious writers, each of you who hold vast and complex and accomplished identities, after coming home, after publishing, you know, Randall and Dwayne a great amount, Luis, uh, your first publication and having recently come home, uh, how do you parse through that? How do you uh, deal with entering literary community with and write about prison without re-stigmatizing yourself? Yo, it's funny. I'm going to take this first, Randall, just because we're like, making you talk first. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because, like, my state number is 251534 but we didn't write it with a dash in the center. So like, I can't even remember my state number the way Randall writes his, right? And it's this thing that in some sense, it's an idiosyncratic way in which all of this shit operates that we reduce when we start pretending like the games around language, like define and describe and totally encompass the thing that we want to say. I personally think that when I say my book is called Felon, or when Randall says my book is called number 289-128, the shit is a challenge in every page. In every page, it is a reminder and an echo and an opportunity for you to think, nah, that's not him. Nah, this is like, this is something else. This is like a code for something. This is a way for me to understand that this is a, this is like a stamp for a system that we need to get rid of. You know, my thing is, the folks who called me formerly incarcerated, I fuck with them. We cool. But listen, man, 
you know, it's other people who were being interviewed in that joint too. It was me and Michael K. Williams, you know, and we both got past in history. But how come it's like my past gets to be the fucking headline of how I'm described? I think that it's a problem with that. I fucking went to Yale Law School. So like if you my ally and you feel like you need to describe me as something that you consider honorific or you want me to stand out in some way, you could say Yale Law, Law graduate. But you ain't even got to say that. You could just say Dwayne. You know, my thing is like, ultimately, you go out in the world and people think of all of these sanitized ways to refer to you. And, and this is not just leadership that's doing this, right? But others will call you formerly incarcerated to your face and nigga behind your back. They will call you formerly incarcerated and then won't hire you. You know, they will call you formally incarcerated and adapt that language, but never say, and listen, as the leadership, as the executive director of the ACLU, I want to acknowledge that in 1996, when we were on the verge of this crisis of incarceration, we were sending letters to niggas in prison saying, fuck y'all. We were sending letters to niggas in prison saying, you ain't on our agenda. And the thing is, like, the same people who adapt this language, who've been doing this work, like adjacent work for decades, they never have to admit the ways in which they were saying felon in 96, 97, 98, 99, 2002. You know, so when I call my book felon, it's because I want you to confront all of it. And I want you to be like, you know what? That don't describe him. So I'm not gonna say felon. I'm not gonna say formerly incarcerated. I'm not gonna say none of it, but we ain't there yet. And so since we ain't there yet, you know, you. I th the thing is, you would never put Jailbird in my in my in my bio. So if I make you use Jailbird, then that makes you check yourself. But if you could start saying formerly incarcerated, you'd be like, yeah, the formerly incarcerated poet, the formerly incarcerated lawyer, the formerly incarcerated father, the formerly <laughs> incarcerated jet skier, the formerly incarcerated nigga. Oh my bad, I wasn't supposed to say nigga. My bad. You know, it's like it's like formerly incarcerated becomes a stand-in of all the ugly shit that you know you ain't supposed to say. So. That's my take. People disagree with me all the time. And I just be like, <laughs> disagree, yeah, I mean, we, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think we we agree on, on a lot of things. Um, but I thought, I, you know, for me, and yeah, I've written about this too, killing I in prison, because I'm very, you know, very cognizant of this in case we've had these conversations too, um, about this whole idea of, you know, what does it mean to sort of like refer to, you know, people in these, in these kind of ways. And I think we have to be careful a lot of times that we don't necessarily re 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 stereotype or, or re you know recriminalize the thing in which we are trying to sort of set free. So I think it becomes a trap. So I think it, it's very it, it, it you know it's very it's a landmine to sort of walk down that 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 path. And I think in one of the reasons um, that things probably haven't changed as much is because of the language. I think. Because when you're on TV or when you listen to the news, the first thing they say is, hey, he's an ex-convict, he's an ex felon You know what I mean? And then, so it's always in a negative connotation, right? And so when Dwayne and I step out into the world, we understand, I think, I'm not, I'm not going to speak for him, but I know he understands sometimes that people want to see, you know, this sort of like what that means for someone to sort of, you know, be able to sort of come out of that experience and do okay. Because that, that does mean something. And, you know, it does. Because I'm saying when you're on the inside and people yeah. come to visit you and you're like, wow. And, you know, and they're telling their story. And, you know, people on the inside, they can spot you a mile a minute whether you, you're genuine or not. And so when you're talking to them, um, you know, there's a, there's a real chance there, man, to sort of reach somebody, right? And sort of say, hey, you know, you can do this. And so we have, so, so a lot of times you have to sort of step out there and do that. So it's a double-edged sword sometimes. So I go out there and make this appearance, this performance as this person, and I understand why I have to do it because, you know, it's what it is. But I'm very aware of, like, you know, the ways that people try to sort of construct you and pick, put these labels on you. And so I try to actively resist that. So I'm going to leave it right there. Let me know what you Luis, before you, before you answer, I, I, we got a question that I'm going to throw in the mix. Sorry to do that to you, but uh, we got a question that says, nobody says the formerly incarcerated Martha Stewart. So how much of this is also about race and class? Luis, you don't have to answer that, but I'm putting it into the room for, for after you speak to it, if you'd like to. Uh, I read that question too. It's, 
I think that it's going to open a whole other road of answer. But um, from my own perspective, I remember it was like three weeks before I had gotten out. And I got out on New Year's Eve. So there was a lot of just excitement in the air about that type, time of year. And what I had seen from the women around me is that they would get nervous or they would, they would go to segregation for whatever reasons. Like the, it, it would just be all of this emotion that, that wasn't processed in a healthy way. And so like shit would just happen right before you got out, you know? And so I remember I called one of my sisters and I was like, man, I, I, I feel like I should be more anxious. Like I am finally coming home. I'm finally leaving this place. And my body was chill. I was calm. I was breathing fine. Like I didn't understand it because what I had seen was anxiety and fear and all of this other stuff. And my sister just pointed out like, you're ready to go home. Like my body, my body was ready. I was ready. And so I don't know if, <clears throat> if it's arrogance or if it's naivety. I don't know what it is, but I don't, I haven't really dealt with a lot of um, kind of those labels in my face. Probably happen a lot behind my back when I'm not in the room. I'm sure there's plenty of conversations about who I was, what I did, where I was, what I was doing, all of that stuff. Um, and maybe there's just more other things to talk about at this point in time, but um, I was very fortunate enough in my situation that I had some factors in my release that 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 weren't very um normal i didn't i had a safe place to go to and women leaving incarceration that is the biggest concern there is not enough housing for women to have a safe place two i don't have minor children that i need that i needed to support and find housing for it so those two factors alone just kind of set me apart from a lot of the different women and also, I didn't have abusive people in my past trying to either find me, hurt me, or remind me of all the bad that I had left with. So I was kind of just set apart just by those factors alone. <clears throat> I did, however, get denied housing due to my uh, criminal record. Um, there are limitations for me, and yet there is such a supportive community around me supportive language around me. Um, people, I, I don't really know the whole, um, I guess I can't put too much weight in the whole formerly incarcerated conversation. Um, there are plenty of worse things that I've been called and that probably could be added to my bio that are gracefully not. And yet, I think my focus has been in these short nine months that I've been out is to be that voice. Um, your question earlier, Kate, was like, when did you, when did the identity of a writer really kind of come into fruition? And I think for me, part of that and part of that realization now is that my voice isn't going to be silenced anymore. And I silenced my voice for a really, really long time, <clears throat> completely outside of like structural opp uh, oppression, just my own kind of fear and lack of coping mechanisms with the stuff that was happening in my life. And I might be kind of like veering off topic, but <clears throat> I think the biggest thing for me right now, dealing with kind of the post-traumatic stuff is um, just relying on the beautiful people that are around me and taking each breath at its, at its own and each day at a time. About Martha Stewart, I don't know. I think people are just loving that she's hanging out with Snoop. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know, maybe she, they're waiting for her crochet designs to come back. I'm not really sure about all that, but um, that's I'll, I'll end with all of that. So, <laughs> Dwayne gave us a lot of resources on Martha Stewart in the chat. So if anybody's interested in pursuing what's being said, including her hanging out with Snoop Dogg, thank you for that research, Dwayne. Uh, there's a couple questions that have come in. I'm going to throw them all kind of in the pot. Um, and I know we're winding down shortly, and I just want to say we'll close with some thank yous and a poem from Randall. So this sort of last round of conversation will bring us towards that. Um, to the person who wanted to hear Duane read poems, I'm so sorry that's not happening tonight, but I highly recommend uh, getting his book, and certainly there's video of him reading online, but 
but no, not tonight. Uh, the questions are, how were you able to push past the labels and the vulnerability of being a poet dialoguing with difficult subjects? Some of that has been addressed. Was there a time when you had to process trusting your writing? Some of that has been addressed by Louise. And then the final question that we have for now is, uh, being that language can be limiting, have you ever considered incorporating more of a di diasporic language or wanted to focus more on African-American vernacular, I think that is, A-A-V-E, or is it neither? How much do you consider your audience and their language, or are you centering your narrative because it's your time now? That, that you might want to read that question again. Yeah. It's in the chat box for everyone to see, but I'm yeah. opening it to any of that. Yeah, I think I, that's, that's a great. Well, go ahead, when you want to talk, that's fine. Um, I just want to say two quick points, right? Everybody knows Martha Stewart went to prison. Everybody knows it. So. You know, like this ain't even like a race thing. Like everybody know, white people go to prison is famous. That shit is all over the news. So we just that's like, the real thing is that regular white people that go to prison, they get to live as regular white people. And so Martha Stewart ain't the issue. It's Joe, you know, whatever Jones that lives down the street. Um, I, I like number four, but honestly, my answer is kind of simple. Like, it was this cool TikTok from this young young lady from um, Baltimore, and she was like, somebody was like, yo, say these things, you know, and she was going through the words, and it was like running down some Baltimore slang, but it wasn't just slang, it was accent, too, and I think, you know, the truth of it is, in a lot of ways, we lose our accent, because we get to travel so much, and not just we, as in we writers, but the United States, with like, just like, you get to travel a lot, and I think your accent, my accent is completely flattened out, I'm certain that Randall don't sound today like he sounded as a as a as an 18 year old younger coming out of out out of the ham at Howard University, right? Right, so right, like, right, right. So, 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 but I, I think we retrieve all of, some of that in our writing. We try to, but but I don't know if it's a. I don't know if it's a. I mean, for me at least, language is not a technique, so to, so to speak. So I'm not trying to find. I'm trying to find ways to recover some of the ways I sounded as a kid or even get some of the ways I sound right now into my writing. But I don't think that I ever thought like to incorporate more diasporic language. I don't speak them, you know what I mean? When I start to speak them fully and trust my tongue in that way, I, I, I might. I just have a question for Lu, for Luis maybe, because I know your work does more of that um, That's what than I'm mine, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, for me, I don't, I mean, I don't, I think I looked at in my first book, the definition of place, there's some vernacular in there. I mean, I actually read um, Zora Neale Hurston's um, Every Tongue Gotta Speak, um, which was, um, she went down the South. Uh, I think this was when her, her and uh, Langston, Langston Hughes was traveling down South. They used to do a whole lot of stuff. I don't know if you knew that. But uh, uh, well, people in the audience, I know some of y'all did. But um, there, was this, there was this book, with, and now, so I was looking at, at a region, a particular place, at a particular time. And so for me, that was definitely something I thought about. But, you know, writing about this, I think, like, like for me, I hadn't necessarily given that a thought. I don't know what that, for me, I don't know what that would look like right now. I think I, that's something that maybe I'm even still trying to figure, you know, discover maybe, or even think about, like, what would that look like? I don't know. Uh, all I got is what I, what I have to work with, and I try to push that to the boundaries, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Louise, talk about your process a little bit, because I, I, I mean, like Dwayne, I know you very well. This is something that you're interested in. So, um, my process. I like that question about you know trusting your writing. Um, I think, I think that that's through the whole way, right? Because it, it's our voice, it's our story. And I remember a friend had told me when I was uh, sharing some of my writing, he had said, no one knows your story better than you do. And that, set, that just kind of set my pace just a little bit sort of like, I have a piece of this story that only I can offer. And so trusting that has always been, um, as of recently, that, that, that's been core. Um, as an Anishinaabe woman who has this beautiful language, Ojibwe language, it's so important for me to, <clears throat> to incorporate that in my writing uh, because I am Ojibwe, I am Anishinaabe. Do I think of my audience 
I'm learning to think of my audience. And yet a lot of my stuff, especially in the This Is Where collection, it's a lot more reflective of where I've been and how I made it through those experiences in my life. So at that point in time, I really didn't have any concern of, of who was going to be the audience, right? Because it was all about survival and kind of reflection. Um, I guess, I don't know, am I, am I losing the question? I think um, I, might, I might have traveled off of the question, but coming back to uh, using Ojibwe language, who I am. And so whether it's, um, I speak, I, I kind of make the joke that I speak Ojibwe because I speak a mixture of Ojibwe and English kind of wrapped together. And sometimes even in conversation, I, I, I kind of forget that the person I'm speaking with doesn't understand Ojibwe. So I have to backtrack and be like, oh, this is what that means. So it just kind of, kind of flows through my writing, you know what I mean? Um, and it's a beautiful language to share. If I knew other languages, maybe I would incorporate those into my writing. Um, but Ojibwe and English, those are both my languages. So at this point in time, that's what I'm going to use. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. I mean, I, when I was called on to host this event, there are so many directions you could go with these conversations. We could be here for a month in a conference setting talking and still not get to the depth of, of what could surface. And you've each really um, centered in your responses, uh, writing, craft, identity, and, and the system, but in a way that's really particular to Randall's offering. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, before I invite Randall to uh, close us with a poem, I want to, uh, first of all, welcome any of you to give a kind of final thought, if you have a final thought, or uh, any thank yous. Of course, we thank each of you. Randall, we thank you for writing this extraordinary book. We thank Brooklyn Historical Society for hosting this event. Um, but I want to turn it over to each of you just to give a chance. And if you have nothing left to say, that's okay too. Uh, I'll jump in at this point in time. I just, uh, Randall, you know how just excited and I'm just in awe of all of your work and just your contribution. And so it's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to uh, support you, you know, love that I actually have the book in hand and I'm just so thankful to the audience who has taken the time just to kind of be here with us. And thank you to you, Kate. So, you know, it's just, it's an honor to always be involved in anything that you do. And I'm just so thankful that we're actually having these conversations that are so necessary not just for all of us, but for, for, the, for the young writers that are going to be sitting in these chairs right next to us. And that, that's so important for me. And I'm just, uh, I had told a friend that this was going to be an intimidating night because of the, the people on this panel. And I just think all of you leave such a great mark in our community of writers. And um, I'm just so blessed by all of you. So Thank you, Randall. Congratulations. Um, I know that there's more to come. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you. Yeah, man, I got mine too, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and man, congratulations. I think one of the things I do want to say, though, right, is, um, man, you got better, which is hard <laughs> to do as a writer, you know what I mean? Especially, like, it's almost like publishing begets publishing. So once you start publishing, you know what I mean? Like people want to publish you. But but what I find really impressive is, man, these poems are better than the previous poems. And, um, you know, and not even that though, because it just adds texture to the previous poems. It adds layers. And it's not even that like the writing, I think the writing has grown, but it's not saying that the writing is better. It's saying that like, it's something distinct about this. It doesn't sound repetitive. And I think that's really hard to do, especially when part of the conversation I have in my head about writing about incarceration is, is this a well that doesn't run deep? Is this a well that pushes you just to go to the most superficial of places? But I mean, if you really listen, you know, when you read a poem, it's like, this ain't in black and white. That's the challenge right there, you know, is how to care about that stuff in this situation. And I think, um, yeah, man, his work gives us that opportunity. So much obliged. 
Thank you, my brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For those who don't know out there, I mean, me and Dwayne probably started our journey from that, you know, from the outside around the same time from through Kavi Khanum. So it's been a wonderful journey, man. Thank you uh, for, I didn't know you was coming in, anyway. I wasn't even worried, but thanks, thank you, appreciate it. I wasn't even tripping on that. You gonna be there, whatever. <laughs> but thank you all, um, and, and Kate's and um, the work that you do at Penn Prison Writing Program is, you know, is definitely needed. It's, it, it, it's, it's valuable and so ne necessary. And since you've been there, you've taken that thing to another place, man. Um, and I've seen it, mm -hmm. I've seen it. Um, but also we've talked so much about a lot of these things over the years, man. And so it was the only person that I knew that could do this was you. Because you knew, you knew that, you knew what was happening, you knew Dwayne and you've been in touch with me. So you had the, so it, it just, it just made sense. So thank you for taking the time to put this together and think about it and look at my work in that way. And I really, really appreciate that, mm -hmm. right? It's your night, but you're giving me the gift. Uh, I will receive it. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. And of course, we got to thank um, on the Brooklyn Historical Society, Marcia, um, Bo, who's handling all of the uh, logistic stuff. Um, thank you for being so gracious to host us tonight. And um, yeah, it, it meant a lot to sort of like, you know, put the book here and let people sort of see, you know, what we're all about and this discussion and hopefully you know, it's another chip in the block and we keep on doing what we do, right? Keep on doing what we do. Yeah. Now you gotta close us out with a poem now. Oh, you want a poem? <laughs> we, we want go. a poem <laughs> as our ending. 289128, Poet in Residence Cell 23, Imagination Running Wild. In the dream fabric of one sail, dangling from sea tier, if not bodies, leaves fluttering against night, rustic sound, a chinook, a brittle swish. Down by the riverbed, call it virginal, alongside open field, day and then that frame. A cold, shivering human on the block, one heel gutter bound, secreted inside a storefront's crest, a person drowned by gin's delirium, suspended inside a half pint caught with loose change. Say a selfless figure in a scream. Another deferral sleepwalking wide awake above daffodil heads painted alabaster. But what of the purples with stereo blue? The mockingbirds obligato, altering time in four moments. If a raven is stuck in obscure dark of night, here everything returns into another mute corridor and If you haven't been convinced yet, get this book, get Louise's book, get Duane's book. They're extraordinary collections of poetry. I'm also a poet and I'm a fan, a major fan of each of these people and their work. Randall, again, a sincere and loud congratulations. I wish we were in person and we could hug. No, right. I'm sending you that energy. <laughs> and uh, and man, I, I, I wish we could see our audience and, and see the reactions because I'm, I'm sure that they've been moved and interested. And I invite everybody to move forward with all of the uh, investment of our panelists tonight and the poems of Randall and uh, do some shit. <laughs> there you go. So Thank I guess you we'll, turn it back, we'll turn it back over to uh, Marcy to say goodbye. Is that what we do? I thought we were going to end there, but maybe okay. she'll pop on. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can we can end here, but then I guess I'll say a, a parting word for everybody who chimed in, um, the hundred and almost close to two hundred people who sort of chimed in. Thank you um, for taking time of your of your uh, day to sort of listen to these words, um, and I hope you know it's worth the time. So thank you. We're gonna close out here. How about that? I'll, I'll see you later. 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 There we go. <laughs> I'll see y'all later, man. We'll talk. Louise, Louise, Kate, we'll talk. We sure will. <laughs>